So I'm gonna start with the uh, most demanded questions regarding the MARPI about, about the lower expansion with the maxillary expansion. Um, we're gonna talk about the MARPI protocol if it's slow or rapid, uh, the lower expansion. And the third thing is if there is no cross bite, what is the real deal of expanding the maxilla? So what are the actual indications? So let's start with the MARPI, if it's uh, rapid or slow. MARPI as a mini screw, uh, rapid palatal expander. So that type of uh, a, um, an acronym is a little bit outdated because the protocols have evolved and we're no longer doing rapid expansion, uh, which was deemed to be rapid. So very long ago, several decades ago in 1960s, Isaacson came up with the rapid protocol of expansion and he was the one to introduce the fixed appliances to expand and he suggested that the increment for expanding the maxilla was 0 0.25 uh, millimeters so it's what it was a quarter of a millimeter so that is the increment that is currently used to expand the maxilla and it can be either used with a slow protocol which for these type of screws is one turn a day or even faster two turns a day and there is a slow protocol when with 0 0.25 the expansion is made with uh, um, couple turns a week uh, two to three turns a week so with this type of expansion slow protocol means that only 0 0.5 or half of a millimeter is increased during the uh, week expansion so this is something that we do with the with those screws that are, have 0 0.25 uh, um the in increments for expansion what about the marpi so those screws have evolved and they are not that aggressive those so those screws have increments of 0 0.11 sometimes 0 0.12 millimeters so in that instance it's always considered a slow protocol the slow protocol means that even with the frequency of one turn a day it's still slow as this is something that happens only 0 0.11 of a millimeter so that means that this is a small increment over the same period of time but the actual stretching of the ligament is going on a, in a smaller increments also literature says that for this type of expansion for the maxillary skeletal expansion the uh, ligament stretch uh, around the teeth has to get to a certain extent when that ligament is no longer bearing that stretch and it does not um, it does not bend itself or it does not produce the tooth tipping effect but instead with growing of that constant pressure maxillary sutures intermaxillary or perimaxillary sutures those sutures that are around the maxilla they start building up that load and they start feeling that expansion with the constant load that is applied within a constant um, evenly spread amounts of time for example we expand one turn every single day we space it out and we schedule it for the same time so that the body knows that it's going to be um, around 24 hours in between those turns and that load is built within uh, within the suture so this is um this is the question and the answer regarding is it slow or rapid yes it's slow uh the initial initial protocol for expansion with mse with maxillary or midfacial palatal expander that what is introduced by dr von moon i was proposed to have six four five three turns uh a day with the same increments with 0 0.11 but that appeared to be um more of a more of a aggressive type of expansion producing some types of adverse effects in terms of headaches uh, unwanted sensation and wanted tension in temples and uh, the tension from the um, perimaxillary muscles and orofacial muscles so that all the all the protocols for expansion have been agreed to be slow with all those screws with the screws that we currently use with MSC appliances, with MARPI appliances to be activated one turn a day. Sometimes it can also be even um, less. It can be one turn every other day or even less. Regarding the mandibular expansion, regarding something that we have to do with the mandible. So that is something 
of the utmost import importance. So Maxilla, even with this low protocol, it creates and it gets a lot of expansion over um, more or less short period of time. Let's say it's four to six, sometimes it's uh, eight, nine weeks, but still the mandible, we cannot expand the mandible even with that amount of pressure over that short period of time. So the mandible has to be started as early as possible. And the only protocol, the only way we can expand the mandible is by priding the molars. Every uh, upriding movement for the molars that creates expansion and that creates the increase in intermolar width to fit the maxilla. This is the biggest protocol about doing anything on the mandible. It's only about upriding the molars. Again, you cannot move those molars, those back teeth outside the bone. So the first, it's the torque, it's the inclination of a tooth within the, their uh, respective bony socket has to be corrected and then it's going to be the uh, actual upriding to that tooth. So we need to I mean, we need to control that this tooth, that the root of that tooth with our planned movement does not hit the bone, does not approach the bone, that the, that the root is not going to be exposed with the uh, with this, that upriding movement. So what we do in our practice and what is the most accurate way of controlling these two types of movements is to have the actual plan of those tooth movements with the CBCT and with the appliance planned based on the CBCT. So when I um, plan those movements for the lower teeth and I plan them particularly with the liners, for me, in my practice, it's the most accurate way to control those movements to make sure that no molar, no root is going outside the bone and it's very accurate and it does not produce any detrimental effects to the, uh, to the teeth. Um, so that is the main point about expanding the mandible. Again, it's upriding. And then the um, important point why we should even expand the maxilla if there is no classic indication for expansion, which is the uh, posterior cross bite, either unilateral or bilateral, why would we care expanding the maxilla? I know it's not taught in the regular uh, dental programs in residencies. The um, palatal expanders, the skeletal expanders are taught as the way, as one of the modifications to the uh, fixed appliance, to the fixed expander. But the indications for those maxillary expander procedures, they have expanded, they have evolved uh, over the time, over the recent, I would say, uh, 10 to 7, uh, 7 to 10 years with the uh, most extensive use of those maxillary expanders by different providers showing that that produces the actual volumetric increase in the nasal passages. And uh, as of now, there are a lot of articles showing the effects, the actual effects of maxillary expansion. And based on how the appliance is born, either it, it is attached to the bone, either it is attached to the, uh, to the teeth, or um, depending on how many screws it has, what type of effects it, produce, it produces. The main effect with those appliances that are attached directly uh, to the bone, direct effect of those is the increase of the nasal volume, the uh, volume of the nasal passages. So this is something that um, gives the biggest effect. Then uh, studies were made showing that the, with the maxillary expansion, with the maxillary skeletal expansion, and with those appliances that actually increase the nasal passages, the nasal airway space, that also produces the effects in increase of the oropharyngeal airway space. Again, so it has to be critically um, assessed, but the main effects of the maxillary expansion is also unlocking those contacts in the back, unlocking the maxilla and letting the mandible slide forward. Maxillary expansion, as I've also um, outlined in my previous uh, Q&A session, it produces it has to ideally produce 70% of skeletal expansion and only 30% of the tooth movement. So we are aiming at having those 70% of expansion. And the rest, which is the tooth movements, that also improves the inclination, the tipping of the molars embedded in those bony sockets on the sides. So that also uprights those molars, that also unlocks those contacts in the back, unlocks the contacts that were keeping the mandible in that position. 
as we know, and going back to the development of the dentition, the uh, first molars, they have more pronounced anatomy and they erupt at the age of six. And this is something that is already developed. So the position of the mandible uh, at the age of six is, is already defined by the airway and the oropharyngeal airway, by the position of the tongue, by the type of breathing, by the type of food consumption, uh, tongue movement. So the first molars will erupt to those positions and they will further lock with their pronounced cusp anatomy. They will lock that position at the age of six. The more permanent teeth erupt, the more all those teeth lock that mandibular position. 